Hey, we're the Buzz. Hey, we're the Wood family. Hi, we're the Cunninghams. Hi, we're the Brewishes. Hi, Hi, we're the Kings. And welcome to Curate Online. And And welcome welcome to Curate Curate Church Online. No! Welcome to Curate Online. Welcome Welcome to to Curate Curate Online. Online. Welcome to Curate Online. Woohoo! Hi and welcome today. We are so glad that you would be tuning in with us and engaging in this way. We know that we can't meet together in person, but I just love that that doesn't stop us from engaging together as a church, engaging together in spirit and also on the chats. So why don't you take a moment to let everyone know who you are, where you're from, and that would be awesome. That's right. I love seeing the chats go off last week and I was thinking this week we could have a battle of the chats, okay. a battle of the gatherings. And so whichever location you're from, which are the gathering you attend, put that in there. Let's mm. see who's getting the, you know, who's most leaning in this morning. Say mm. hi to one another. Uh, that'd be fantastic. And if you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. Yeah. Uh, it's great to have you and we just appreciate you taking time to tune in. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Actually, if this is your first time, I'm Katie and this is Joel and we are so glad that you're here. Um, Actually, Joel, last week you shared a couple of things at the beginning and I just thought it was really awesome. And could you share that a little bit more again? Totally, I could. Uh, Yeah, we're just talking about doing the season well and last time and the previous times we've been through lockdown as a country, we saw different patterns in our church and some of them them healthy and others not and just as pastors, we just want you to come through the season strong. We know that everybody experiences in different ways, everyone has different pressures, but we want to see our faith be strong through these seasons. We want to see our connection to our church family grow and we want to see our hope for what we believe God could do in the future of our lives grow. So would you keep pressing into God, making time for him, you know, maybe lay off the vaccine conspiracy theories and put that time into, you know, spending time with God or something like that. Uh, Would you make sure you're reaching out to people? Thank you to everyone staying connected. Shout out to our small group leaders who were doing that and making sure that there's community and let's stay hopeful. Um, And let's just, let's come out of this stronger. Let's not wane in our commitment to the Lord and to each other. Yeah. Actually, it's so important to stay connected with each other um, just in normal times, but this is such an abnormal time and abnormal season that we're in. And so it's really important, more important now than ever, that we stay connected. And on that, we actually have this new resource um, called Unhurrying with a Rule of Life. And that's something that our small groups are going to be working through um, in the next week or so. And so um, if you want to be connected in with a small group, if that sounds um, interesting, to you then you can go to curatechurch.com slash connect and we would really love to connect you with a small group it's going to be an amazing resource that we can do together oh i'm so excited that we're doing that at this time it's actually very timely because when people are taking a different pace Mm -hmm. to life things Mm -hmm. are changed it's a Mm -hmm. perfect time to have a fresh look at our lives and develop a rule of life a great spiritual practice yeah yeah, really cool. Well, we're in for a treat today. We are. I'm actually going to preach in my slippers <laughs> for the first ever time. Wow. I don't know if I can get them up there. That was pretty good. That's, yeah, it was horrible, but it's going to be great. You yeah. should pray for us. Okay, Because everyone's to. going through different things out I there. I know, I know. Shout out to all the parents. And to all, all of the business owners. All the business owners. Oh my gosh, we've spent so much time in prayer for all of you. And hey, if you do need prayer, even just pop that in the chat. You can reach out because we would love to give you any extra support and prayer that we can. We believe that prayer matters. Um, I wanted to read to you out of Philippians. Um, and it says, Philippians, what am I doing? 4 verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so I just thought, let's just take a moment to, what is it that you're worrying about? What is it that you have anxiety about? I know there's much to feel anxious about. And let's bring those to God in this moment and believe that he hears us and he is able to bring um, the peace that surpasses all understanding. So would you join me in prayer? Awesome. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather this way as a church. Lord, I thank you that we strengthen each other as the body. And I pray that we would be encouraged and strengthened by our connection today. 
And Father, we pray for every single person that has worries, that is feeling anxious uh, towards anything, Lord Jesus. We pray for our business owners, for the parents, um, for everybody who has anxieties and worries. We bring them to you, God. And we thank you, Lord, that in your hands, that's a worthy place to put them. Um, that you are such a big and wonderful God and that you will give us the peace that we need. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that cares, you are a God that sees us, and you are not a God without power, but you are a God with a lot of it and that you are near. And so we pray for every single person, Lord Jesus. We give our anxieties and worries to you. Amen. Amen. Well, let's worship together wherever you're tuning in from. Let's take some time to just mm. really center ourselves on the Lord's goodness. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. 
What a great time of worship. Thank you for joining us in that. Thankful for the team that took time to record that before lockdown. So we have all of those on file for these moments. It's, if you're just joining us now, it's great to have you. Make sure you say hi in the chats. Uh, we're going to have a great time. We're going to finish our series on financial freedom. So this is part four. If you want to catch up on the other parts, you can obviously catch up online and through YouTube, whatever else like that. It's been so cool uh, over the last week. Last week we talked about justice and I just want to say thank you to all of you who gave towards uh, the things we were talking about in Haiti and in Afghanistan. Thank you for helping us support Open Doors and Convoy of Hope. And I know many of you gave directly to those organizations and some of you gave through the church and then we're topping that up with Curate Cares budget as well and sending that out. So thank you so much. It's not too late to give. We're going to send the gifts next week. So you've still got this week to give. So thank you to everyone who's done that and if you missed out here's a great reminder for us to be able to do that i've also loved over these this course of the series so many people have messaged me uh, and told me how much it has helped them how much it's helped them figure things out newly married couples people that have been doing this for a long time people have been reviewing starting the process getting things in order in this time and so thank you for leaning in uh, to this message i had a friend this week say to me what a great message uh, last week i agree with 85% of it and I said well that's why I'm the teacher because you still got 15% to learn and uh, I just love how our whole spirit of the church has really evolved and really matured over the last few years we were actually really open to learning about these things and I just love the way you've been leaning in being teachable it's fantastic and uh, just thanks for your openness um, remember we've got some awesome resources you can check out if you want to take this journey uh, further which I'd encourage you to and a link's coming up where you can find our recommended books on this topic they're going to help with all different sorts of things so check some of those out what a great time to read a book or listen to a new audio book uh, so let's keep engaging in the chats. If you, if I say a great quote, why don't you put that in the in in the chats? If you uh, like a point, if you you know say amen, if you agree, if you're being challenged, maybe say oh I don't know, you know do whatever you want to do. But it's great seeing people engage in that as I preach. Uh, it's awesome. Can't see you in person, but I can see your chats, and it's fantastic. So thank you for doing that. We started this series by saying God wants us to be financially free. He wants us to be spiritually free, as in money and possessions. They don't have a piece of our heart, but God has all of our heart. And we said that God also wants us to be physically free. That actually we can apply his biblical wisdom, his, the wisdom of his word to our lives. And we can actually lead our lives in a direction of greater financial free, freedom rather than entrapment so that we can be a greater blessing as the year go, years go on in our life. And we can be more free to fully follow God and unencumbered by debt and different things like that. And so I want our church to be growing in financial freedom. We started saying that as we look at this, we don't want to just jump to principles or to the what's or what we're going to do, but we really wanted to start by thinking about how do we see this stuff? How do we think about this stuff? Paradigms, ways of seeing reality. One of my favorite verses, if it's yours, you can put it in the chat, is Romans 12, chapter uh, Romans 12 verse 2 it says do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will know uh, and you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will and sometimes we just jump straight to like what do we need to do but we don't actually renew our mind and align our thinking with God and God says that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts his ways are higher than our ways and so this whole conversation about paradigms has been about aligning our thoughts with his thoughts because from that place it's so much easier to know what his will is and be able to discern the Holy Spirit's voice in an accurate way so that we can actually partake in the practices that he would want us to do in our financial areas and we've looked at a whole bunch of these different paradigms we've looked at uh, the paradigm of the heart and we've said that the number one thing at stake when it comes to money and possessions is your heart. Money is deceitful, money can be distracting, and money can choke out the kingdom life that God is trying to build in us from the inside out. So we need to always think about money from the paradigm of the heart. We talked about the church. 
Now, so often there seems to be a lot of hangups about church and I get it, but man, we've got to get over it because God loves the church and God loves the local church and the local church is his idea. And often people think, man, I want to be generous or I want to help people, but I don't want my money to go to the church. And we have to understand that's not a godly way of thinking. We don't want to just care about people being hungry. We want to care about the gospel getting out there, people being discipled, the worship of the Lord continuing. So we talked about the paradigm of the church and how we need to see it like God sees it. We talked about the paradigm of justice last week and about how God cares about the hungry, the oppressed, the afflicted, those with less. And he wants to use those of us with more to help those people who have less. Those with more than enough to help those with not enough. And we must see our resources, not just as a blessing to us, but as a blessing that God wants to use to go through us to the others that he cares about. And we talked about eternity, that this life will end. And we can't take anything with us, but we can send it ahead by using it for God's purpose. And we can store up for ourselves with the way we manage money, eternal reward in heaven. And I think that's an that's important grounding thought to remember. So today we're going to talk about one more paradigm. We're going to dive into some principles and we're going to get after it. We're going to wrap up this series. So I hope you're enjoying it. Our last and our final paradigm is this. It's a paradigm of stewardship, a paradigm of stewardship. Stewardship's not like a common word. I don't assume that everybody's going to understand what I'm talking about, but really what I'm getting at is what you have and what I have is not really mine and it's not really yours. It's God's and it's been entrusted to us and we will be accountable for how we manage it. A greenkeeper doesn't own the golf course, they just care for it. They're entrusted with resources to keep it and to develop it. A hotel manager doesn't own the hotel, they just steward it. Parents, we don't own our children, we just steward them. They were a gift from God, they're God's. When you rent a house or you lease a building or you borrow a lawnmower, you don't own it. In, that, in those moments, you're a steward of it. You're somebody entrusted with the care of somebody else's thing. And in our life, we are all so tempted to act like owners. We say, I worked hard for it, I earned it, and it's mine. But that is not the way God sees it. Let's turn to a couple of verses. The first is Deuteronomy 8, 17. It says, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Not only is everything we have, the, the psalmist says that everything is the, the world is the Lord's and everything in it, but not only that, but even our ability to produce wealth comes from God, is a gift from God. We are just stewards. David was praying in 1 Chronicles 29.10 as he was offering up the gifts of the people for the future building of the temple. And it says this in 29.10, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and the earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over it all. Wealth and honor, they come from you and you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart, and you're pleased with integrity. 
All these things I have given willingly and with an honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people are who are here and have given it to you. Can you hear it? God owns it all, and he has entrusted it to us, and we are accountable, and therefore we should manage it as he wills it, not just as our will. When it comes to the way we see money, we can't see it as mine. We need to see it as God's and entrusted. And therefore, we should consult his thoughts, his wills, his desires, um, his cares in the way we steward what has been entrusted to us. Could you imagine this? Perhaps I had to go away for a really long time. And for whatever reason, I wasn't able to support my wife and her kid and, and her kids sometimes I would like to think that but and our kids directly and let's say I called a friend and I said hey I've got to go away for a while I can't get any money to my wife but I'm going to send you money every month I'm going to send you money every week or whatever it is and I just want you to make sure that she's taken care of I want to make sure that what I give to you 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 make sure her needs are taken care of after her needs are taken care of you can keep the rest and do with it what you will Imagine I went away for a long length of time and I came back only to discover I'd been seen, sending money to my friend, but he hadn't been taking care of my wife and, and our kids and that they weren't being fed and they didn't have all of their needs met. Now, I would be pretty angry. I'd be pretty upset. And I wonder if sometimes that's how God feels because he's entrusted stuff to us for a particular purpose, but we're not stewarding it with what he cares about in mind. Obviously, his church is his bride and he cares about his church. He cares about the hungry. He cares about the lonely. He cares about the oppressed. He cares about the sick. He cares about the addicted. He cares about those who are suffering injustice. And if we are not stewarding with his heart and mind, we're missing the whole point. We're stewards, not owners. When someone doesn't care for something that's entrusted to them, it either shows a complete disdain for the owner or a complete ignorance of what and why it has been entrusted. When someone doesn't care for something that's entrusted to them, it either shows a complete disdain for the owner or a complete ignorance of what has been entrusted. For those of us who keep most of what is entrusted to us for ourselves and do with it whatever we want for our own end with little care for God's church, God's people, the poor and the victims of this world with little perspective of eternity, which one is it? Do we have disdain for the owner? Do we not care what he thinks? Or have we mistaken the fact and we, we've been ignorant of the fact that we've been entrusted with something? I don't know which one it is, but I think it's important for us to soberly ask the question. So now we have it. We have the heart, the church, justice, eternity, stewardship as the ways God sees reality when it comes to finances and how we should manage what has been entrusted to us. Now, we've spent weeks now talking about these things, and I know everyone's been wanting to get to, so what? So what do I do with my money? How much do I give? How much do I put there? I don't know the answer for every single person's situation, but I know it's important to get the thinking right. And if you know me, you know that I don't really do much that I haven't really thought through well. I'm a big, passionate believer about getting the right theology, the right belief system, and that allows us to then be able to interpret in our complex and modern world how to live out the correct heart before God. It's not a box to tick. It's not something like if you do this and do that, you've done it. It's more complex than that. And so everybody's situation is different. But I want to finish by talking about some principles. And I want to talk about them from the context of like how Katie and I and our family, how we do this financially. And I'm going to show you all of this wisdom from the Proverbs. And so I hope that um, this helps. Because I should always consider God's will and his ways before I use any money, before I commit any money, before I save any money, or before I spend any money. And every single one of us, we have income and we have assets and we'll have future income and future assets that we need to uh, steward according to the will and paradigms of God. Now, our season of family has changed a lot over the years. I remember when we were you know, newly married, 
and we had a, two kids and we're struggling to make ends meet, we're struggling to get by. I remember that unless Katie's dad brought around a tin of formula every week, you know, literally we couldn't afford the formula. We were out of money, we had nothing spare. So we know what it is to be in those really lean, tough times on government support, falling below, below the minimum income sort of thing. And we know what it is as well to be incredibly blessed and to be well taken care of. And we've enjoyed these different seasons of life. So what I'm sharing is some of the practices we've learned across this journey. And I think we can all find ways to apply them in our lives. The first one is the first principle, the first practice I want to say is get a budget. Somebody put that in the chat. Get a budget. If you don't have a budget, put it in the chat. I don't have a budget, but I'm getting a budget. Listen to Proverbs 21.5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. One of the hasty shortcuts we can make in our lives is to not have a budget. Make a budget. There's lots of tools online and a steward knows what they're receiving and they direct where it's going. If you don't direct your money, your money will direct you. Making one is easy, sticking to one is a lot harder, but I wanna encourage you by starting by at least making one. If you're married, meet regularly about, about your budget. If you're single, get an accountability partner maybe around a budget, but you need a budget. You need to direct the money. You need to know what's coming in, where it's going. You need to look at it and go, is it in balance? Is enough going to God? Is enough going to this? Am I saving for my future? How much do I actually have left to decide about so that we can steward our money wisely? Get a budget. The second thing is a practice that we've not ha that we've had is a budget. The second thing is the tithe. The tithe. Some people love the tithe. Other people get upset about the tithe. I think I get a lot of emails about the tithe, wondering about the tithe, and I want to explain it to us. Proverbs three nine says, "Honor the Lord with your wealth, and the best part of everything you produce. Then He will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth." and the best part of everything you produce. This is Proverbs, it's not the law. These are money principles I'm talking about. What is the tithe? The tithe is the first 10%. We believe, Katie and I believe, in honoring God with the first and at least the first 10%. I don't believe it's a law. I believe it's a principle and it's a practice. I don't believe it's a have to. I believe it's something we get to do. I believe everything in the era of grace calls us beyond the law. The law said don't murder, but under grace we understand don't even be angry. Uh, and, uh, under law we're called not to commit adultery, but under grace we're called to not even look at one another with lust. Under law, the Jews might have been called to 10%. We are called to understand everything comes from God and to be above and beyond generous with that. So it's not about a law, it's a principle and a practice. Here's why it matters. First, it's worship. It's worship because it's giving him the first. It's honoring the Lord with our first. And that is a biblical principle. It's a spiritual practice of trust and dependence. Every time I put God first in my finances, I'm actually saying, I trust you, God. I trust you, God. I'm putting you first. I'm depending on you. I recognize you as my source. I'm leaning on you. It honors God. When we give him uh, our first and our best, it honors him. It says that he is the most important thing in our lives. It protects my heart. When I give over the first, it's, pay, it's putting God as above my money and that protects my heart. If for us, it goes to our local church. It goes to our local church because I think that is the most obvious place it should go. It's the only organization God started. It's, it's, the, it's how God's filling the earth with himself. We talked about all of that in the, the church week. It's where we receive our spiritual sustenance. It supplies our spiritual family. Um, if we receive from the teaching in our church and we don't contribute to our church, we're actually not living biblically. So we start by giving our tithe to our local church. Um, it's where we start in our generosity and it's important to remember that it's not where we finish. There will be a very small few amount of people listening to me today who the tithe is maybe too much for them to get started. Maybe you're a solo mum, 
Maybe you're on the benefit. Maybe you're just struggling to figure out how to get through the season in your life. God knows your situation. He knows your heart. I have solo mums reach out to me all the time how to work this out. Maybe some other people you're married, but your spouse doesn't believe in Jesus. So you can't figure out how to give away the first 10%. God knows your heart. He knows where you're at. You can you can trust that he sees your heart and you can find a way to be proportionately generous to him. Start somewhere is the point, but for most people listening to me, 10% is too little. It's not where we should stop. It's just our starting place. It's just a principle. It's just a guide. If we were to gonna, gonna pick any number from the Bible, it would be the obvious number to start with because there's so much history behind it. Hear me, not a law, a principle, a practice a way of honoring God, a way of trusting God. We need to be percentage givers because when we're percentage givers, it keeps our giving in proportion to our earning. And that is an important biblical principle. We practice the budget, we practice the tithe, we practice giving generously beyond it. Proverbs 11.25 says, the generous will prosper, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. For us, we put aside money each week to be beyond generous. We top this up when we receive extra and unexpected money. We sponsor children with this money. We give to events, to churches, to conferences, to ministries. We support things like Open Doors and Convoy of Hope. We commit to kingdom builders every year and we stretch what we think is possible to support the vision of the church. We'll be given in the Curate Cares offering later in this year in December. We help random people as the Spirit leads us. We give an emergency appeal to make a difference like Haiti and Afghanistan and we love giving. I, for us it's a huge driver in what we do. We want to be generous. I always dreamed of being this generous person. My dad was such a generous person and uh, he just he would just give, give things away. He had no concern for their value almost to his detriment at times but I just love that spirit and I've been highly influenced in my life by generous people. I've been inspired by them and so I've been wanting to be like them. Our giving is always church centric. We're always looking for organizations that partner and do their work through the church. That's why I love organizations like World Vision and Tear Fund and Compassion because they're helping people in Convoy of Hope and Open Doors because they're helping people all over the world but through local church and I think that's holistic and it's beautiful. All sorts of people are gonna give to, you know, cancer wards and other important things in this world but Christians need to support the work of the gospel. And there's something miraculous about God's way of providing. And I think he does look to bless people who have committed themselves to be a blessing. It is a promise. It's a truism that God will refresh those who refresh others. I think God's looking for people who can be conduits of his blessing to his purposes on this earth. And he loves to get behind those people. And we've experienced that in our life. I could share story after story from our own life and from people's lives around us of how God has come through when they've committed themselves to being above and beyond generous. It's not our motivation. I don't give to be blessed. I give because I am blessed. Come on, does anyone feel blessed out there? You could put that in the chat. I give because I'm blessed. I give because I'm blessed. Our goal that we're walk working towards as a family is to be able to give away 30% of our income. And I uh, uh, we think of everything that we do and we're excited to reach that goal hopefully over the next few years. You can consider how to be generous in your will, in your inheritances, where you give these things. There's so many ways we can be generous in our lives. The next practice, the fourth one, is saving and investing. Proverbs 20 verse 4 says, Those too lazy to plow in the right season will have no food at the harvest. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Listen to this. If you don't save or invest anything, you will never have more than you have right now. If you always spend all of your income, you will never be wealthier. You will never have more. You need to build a pattern of saving 
and investing. We contribute to KiwiSaver. We contribute to our kids' KiwiSaver. We have a separate bank account and another bank where we put money aside each week. That's not for spending. It's not for saving for a holiday. It's growing a nest egg that we can live off in case of emergencies that uh, can build into investments in the future. We have investments we contribute to weekly. We pay off as much of our mortgage as quickly as we possibly can. And we're believing to be mortgage free in the next 10 years. We keep it in balance. Uh, we, we honor the Lord. We give above and beyond, but we're also giving to our future as well. And it's not one or the other. It's about keeping these things in balance. And I want to let you know, even if it's small, do something. What we can do in this season of our life is more than we've ever been able to do in any other season of our life. But because we've been doing it for a while, we actually have something. And sometimes we can despise the days of small beginning. We can think, well, I don't have much, so we don't get started. But the sooner you get started, the bigger difference it will make. Now, get this. If between the age of 15 and 24 for those 10 years, you saved and invested $5,000 a year and you never saved another cent for the rest of your life, at age 65, you would have a million dollars more from only saving that first $100,000 over, oh, that first $50,000 over that 10 years, you would have a million dollars more than somebody who saved and invested $5,000 a year from the age of 25 to 65, who did it for those 40 years, you would have a million dollars more just because you started earlier, because that is the difference in compound interest and the way it works. So save and invest. Church, build up wealth, not so that you can be wealthy, build up wealth so that you can be a greater blessing in the future than you are today. The next thing that we need to consider when we're practicing these paradigms is debt and consumerism. Proverbs 22 verse 7 says, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Look, I don't know about you, but in our life, we've been caught in this trap too many times of dumb debt. We don't now use, we don't use afterpay, we don't use credit cards, we don't use higher purchases because we've been caught in the trap too many times in our lives. If you don't have the money to buy it, don't buy it. Act your income. What seems like cheap, what seems like a deal is only ever a trap. In fact, if we don't learn to practice delayed gratitude, um, it, we won't ever be able to be good money managers. Learning to practice delayed gratitude, learning to be content with our lot in life is actually a really important part of good money management. The debt trap is stopping people from being generous. It's stopping people from being, from saving. It, it's often an excuse for people honoring God because they're like, I got all this debt, now I can't give. And so we're actually getting in this trap of our own choices. We were not free to honor God. Now is all debt Debt bad? Of course not. Lending for your house, that's not bad debt. It's lending for an asset that's going to go up, but still pay it off as quickly as possible because the, the uh, borrower is still slave to the lender. But don't be borrowing for things that are going to depreciate. Don't be lending for things that are going down in value. Don't be borrowing for shopping and silly things like this. Stay away from afterpay. Stay away from credit cards. Stay away from higher purchases. We don't need them. It's the trap of debt and consumerism. We're almost at the end. Our second to last one is spending. We need to know as we practice good money management, financial freedom, that God wants you to enjoy what he has blessed you with. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and a good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. God created this amazing, beautiful, fantastic, phenomenal world. He created it with like unnecessary beauty 
and with unnecessary intricacy and masterpiece. He created the, the, the landscapes and the seascapes, these beautiful things that just give us the sense of ser serenity and wonder. He creates these uh, sunsets and these just the beautiful forests and the rivers and the glaciers and all these things we see, the drama of the mountains. He created it because he wants us to enjoy the beauty of this world. He wants us to enjoy our lives. He created us to enjoy life, to enjoy him, to rejoice in him. Doesn't mean it's always easy. No, but can we find joy in it? Can we enjoy it? Yes. And we need to know that God actually blesses us in our lives, not just so we can honor him, not just so we can be a blessing, not just so we can save for a better future and be smart with our money, but also so we can enjoy our lives too, so that we can have have a great meal with friends so that we can enjoy a holiday at times within our means. We, he wants us to be able to enjoy. The point is, don't enjoy everything God has entrusted to you. Make sure that you are not the center of all of the money management. We've tried to get our living expenses down to about 65% of our income. And it makes a huge difference when you can get it down to that level and just enjoy that and be content with what that is. Stop search and trade me looking for another purchase. And that is a dangerous thing when we're all, when we're all in lockdown at the moment. If you stop going on social media and getting ads popping up, you'll stop knowing what you don't have. Oh, we often joke that like going to Bunnings is like wandering around looking for something to need. And it's like, man, I didn't even know they had a tool for this, but now I want it. And we can often get caught up like um, just wasting our money rather than enjoying it for what God has intended it to be. I may be going a bit back to the other point there. So, but don't feel guilty for enjoying what God has blessed you with at the same time. Just keep it all in proportion. Live your income level. And finally, in everything, trust God. Proverbs 11:28 says, trust in your money and down you go. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like the leaves in spring. We don't want to be people who trust in money. We want to be people who trust in God. It's all about Him. So as we arrive at the conclusion of this four-week series, what are we going to do about it? You know, I like to drive it home. I like to say it straight up. I don't want to beat around the bush, but many of us can grow in the era of our finances. Jesus said that those who hear the word but don't obey the word are like foolish builders who build their house upon the sand. Everything seems fine until the rain, the tough season, the resistance, then their life is shown for what it is. And those who don't obey, who only hear, it's like the structure of their life gets thrown away in the times of storms. But those who listen and obey, they are like those who build a house upon a rock, upon sure foundations. So what do you need to obey from this series? What do you need to obey? Here's some reminders that I think, and I just want to say straight up as the pastor of the church, if you, if you respect me as a pastor and teacher, here's my straight up honest opinion, summing up everything we talked about and how we need to obey and put it into practice. We all need to honor God with our money. We need to honor God with our money, not just with our lip service. We need to honor him with our money. We need to have a pattern with our finances of honoring him and putting him first. We need to all be contributing to our local church. I think every person who's a member of our local church should be contributing to their local church. And I know that about half of the people at least do not. So here's my honest challenge to you and my honest invitation to you. Get over whatever it is and become a contributor. Become a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. I've said before in years gone by, if every person in our church tithed, man, the sums would be phenomenal. We'd be giving away about 70% of our budget to the poor and needy in this world. We'd never need to have any special offerings for Curate Cares, Haiti, Afghanistan, Vision Offering, Kingdom Builders, because there'd be such an abundant supply. I think that's what God dreams of, and that's what we should step into that idealism of the scripture. Contribute to your local church. I think every single one of us should find ways to give above and beyond as we're led. 
what that looks like for each of us is going to be different. The percentage, the number is going to be different. But we should all just be looking to be open-handedly generous. For some people, it might be a couple of dollars a week. For other people, it might be a couple of hundred. For others, it might be a couple of thousand. We've got the full spectrum in our church. But we should be looking to be generous above and beyond. We should all be preparing for a better future by saving and investing. Keep it in balance. Don't give it all away, but don't save it and hoard it all for yourself. Maybe keep those things in proportion with one another. Save and prepare for a better future. Always with your heart open before God, always with the idea to be a greater blessing, to follow Him more fully, never to have it distract you. Next one, live within your limits. Live your income, live within your limits. Make sure you spend less than you earn and you will be financially free. Stay away from dumb debt and enjoy and be thankful for what God has provided. You know, when we're supposed to say grace before we have our meal each day, it's not about, you know, having this religious thing. It's about reminding ourselves that we can enjoy life because God has blessed us. It's honoring Him. I want to encourage you, get it sorted today. Do get it reviewed today. Get out the spreadsheets today and get out the bank things and make the payments and sort it all out so that you can live out these things because it's about the heart. It's about the church. It's about justice. It's about eternity. And it's about stewarding what God has entrusted to us. Wherever you're at, know that God is just wanting to lead you to more life. He's not wanting something from you. He's wanting something for you. If you're here and you're listening today for the very first time, and you're hearing about Jesus for the very first time. I haven't talked a lot about him today, but he is the reason for all of this. He loves you and he's for you and his grace is available to you. You can find forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus today. The pathway is inviting him into your life, is repenting, turning, thinking differently, uh, apologizing for what's been and heading your life on a new path with him. But it's available to everyone. He's ready to help anyone who wants help today. All you have to do is reach out and ask for help. Our team is available right now. If you have any questions, send them through. I'll be answering questions and would love if everyone would stay connected to this season. I want to pray for you all. Um, let's get ready uh, to receive that and we'll see you all next time. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time gathering today today. Thank you for all of the people tuning in. I want to pray a blessing over their lives. Holy Spirit, would you direct us with what our next steps are to obey your leading in our lives. God, thank you for the people tuning in that are just starting to discover their faith and just starting to discover you. Lord, would you reveal yourself to them? Would you be present with them? Would you connect them with the right people? God, as we go through these crazy times, we're trusting in you. We're leaning on you. We're turning back to you every single day. Would you be with our church? Would we come out of the stronger, better, uh, deeper, all in you? Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for joining us today. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you.